Soul Futures. What a great way to start off Monday morning and talk about my fears. So, the biggest fears I have over the next 10 years is not AI taking over or world wars or jobs being replaced. It's everyone maintaining the status quo and not changing. You know, maintaining these centralized organizations, the same institutions, the same operating system for society. And why? Well, I think most people just kind of like accept that, you know, the society is the way it is. That is part of life. You know, they accept that these institutions are part of life because we're raised in them. You're born into a system that you didn't have any choice in, that you can't opt out of. You, you know, um, you operate under your country's laws, under their rules, under their governance, under the societal structure. And sure, in most like developed countries, it's, you know, it's a fairly good lifestyle. No one's getting shot up in the street usually. You've got abundant food. You can work. You can make an income. You can have stuff. But I think because we live in a country, like particularly in Australia and others like that, um, where the society, the lifestyle is fairly okay, that we have very little complaint to complain about, and so we don't really question the institutions, the structure. And so I think if you start trying to explain that the way society structures in terms of these hierarchies and centralized kind of institutions, like governments and businesses and banks and all sort of thing, if you explain to people why that's bad, they don't get it. I mean, I think even the very words themselves, centralized versus decentralized, which is what the entire like blockchain developer anarchist movement is all talking about, the masses don't care. They don't understand it. They don't care. So that's an example, when you say the word decentralized Uber, like does the average layman, does the average person ha have any comprehension of what that means or even give a shit or care at all? <laughs> I mean, what it does mean is really giving power back to the people. So rather than having a company, Uber Inc., between you and your driver taking a massive cut, you can just get rid of that middleman. And this is one of the big selling points, one of the big, the big promises, the big visions of the blockchain community is that you can decentralize that and remove the middleman. Do the same thing for Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, but so my greatest fear is that the masses just won't care because, sure, you can build these decentralized dApps that live on the blockchain that do this, all these cool, fancy, crazy stuff that completely remove the middleman. But if the masses don't adopt it, if they instead continue to use Uber, the Airbnbs, the Facebooks, the brands they recognize, the centralized institutions they recognize, then nothing changes. Even if the decentralized options can compete on price because they can basically remove the middleman so they can offer near zero fees, all that's going to happen is the big institutions are just going to decentralize their own backend. You're seeing this right now with the banks. So the banks have actually all got together already and they're now starting to like build all of their backend systems on blockchain technology, but on their own private blockchains. And like I said in previous videos, all the stooges in suits, all the financial stooges are seeing the blockchain technology as a way to make their backends more efficient but maintain the status quo. I mean, one of the great quotes from history from either one of the Rockefellers or one of the Rothschilds, the big banking elites, um, he basically said that, you know, give me control of a country's monetary policy and I don't care who makes their laws. And that's the beauty of cryptocurrencies and things like Bitcoin is that the monetary policy, you know, money is not made by the government, it's not controlled by the government, it's completely its own entity that cannot be manipulated or controlled. And then it allows individuals to have complete and absolute control over their money. So you have a, a blockchain wallet address or whatever, rather than storing your money in a bank where they go off and spend it and do other things with it. But my big fear here is that in 10 years time, all the banks will still exist. They'll, be, they'll probably have, like monopolize more. There'll be like one or two really big banks because they'll have bought off the others after the next financial crash. And because the masses understand a bank account and they understand that you put money in a bank account, but they don't understand what happens afterwards or how money's created, they'll just keep doing that. So they'll maintain that status quo. The banks will maintain their power. In a recent interview between Elon Musk and Sam Altman, uh, Musk said this awesome quote. He basically said that, you know, technology doesn't just happen. Someone actually has to make it happen. There's a lot of work that goes into, like, bringing that technology to reality. Ethereum and other blockchain developer platforms are, are, are going through that struggle right now. There's a massive technical challenge. That's why there's, like, lots of amaz amazing engineers and cryptographers and, you know, hardcore programmers but I think perhaps the greatest challenge after that is just adoption, user adoption. How do you get people to move off, move across to these decentralized services and dApps? It has to be such a better offering than what they're used to. I think to the end consumer or the end user, you can't use any of the, any of the blockchain decentralized aspects. You can't use any of that as a selling point because people won't care or understand it. Hey kids, come use this new decentralized Facebook. It gives the power back to you. It's better than Facebook because it's decentralized and open and gives power back to the people. And it's on a blockchain and it has its own currency. Wow. And potentially, the younger generations are becoming more and more conformist. So my good mate Travis, who actually teaches at university, he was one of the co-founders of HackerGong, he's been noticing this trend, which makes no sense. I don't know how to objectively prove this, but from his subjective experience, he's noticed that they're just more conformist. Um, they're basically less able to think outside the box. They're less questioning of authority. Perhaps it could be because our generation, so I'm like 29, our generation kind of grew up in the era of like forums and like a more open internet where everything was open. There weren't any paywalls or any gardens or any apps. And I think for our generation, it was like very common for us to like, you know, build computers from scratch and kind of like tinker and open things up and break them and see what happens and see how things work. 
Whereas the, the generation going to university now, they kind of grew up in the era of tablets and, and compact laptops and um, walled gardens like Facebook and Instagram and Tumblr, where perhaps it's less about tinkering and less about, cons- about producing and more about just consuming and operating within these little closed walled environments. So if that's true, that aspect's worrying as well because that means they're going into, you know, they're just going to maintain the status even more. They're going to maintain the same system, the same job structure, the same everything. And I've met a lot of these kids who, like, you know, they've they, they just never been exposed to a different type of uh, viewpoint. Like, they're, they're, they're following the path of uni degree, job, climb the ladder. And now the startup scene's kind of going the same way. I mean, like, academics, government employees, and people who've been in, the, in a job for the past 10, 20 years suddenly uh, are exposed to this idea of, like, hey, you can launch a startup and make more money. But it seems now the way to succeed in the startup scene is to really just identify a huge big corporation and find one tiny little problem they have and make a solution for that, and that's your startup. If you go look at the vast majority of companies and startups in Australia and elsewhere that get funding, that's what they're doing. They're getting seed funding and Series A funding to solve one particular problem for a corporation in the hopes they'll get bought. And this is what's happening, like all the big companies are basically buying up all the smaller startups. The startups are essentially just R&D wings for big companies, and that's a problem because it monopolizes these companies even more. But the startup scene sees no issue with this. Investors see no issue with this because there's money being made. I mean, you can make a couple of million dollar exit within a couple of years if you do that approach. Cool. But I think maybe if you extrapolate this out another 10, 20 years, you basically end up in a situation like in Mr. Robot with Evil Corp, where they've basically bought up all the smaller companies and they're a single global conglomerate. Centralization like that, like everything monopolizing and everything becoming under one entity, is a really, really bad thing. It completely goes against evolution. It's quite literally what cancer does. The foundational aspects for any type of evolving system, life and the universe itself, is variation, lots of things, selection, and then heredity. If you centralize any system, uh, you know, companies, governments, businesses, life itself, if you centralize it into one giant glob, then it's less resilient and it's more likely to collapse and be killed. <laughs> so, back to the original point. So, I've, I've been trying to think of the wordings, the linguistic wormholes, like I talked about, um, the ways, the incentives in which to encourage people to move across these decentralized systems without even knowing it. The biggest aspects we've got so far is that uh, blockchain technologies are great because they're essentially, they build the network effect. I mean, every time you add something new to it, it's just growing larger and larger. And the best I've got so far is like the biggest hack you can do to kind of hack the current economy and bring people onto a new decentralized economy is to offer them money. If you can offer them, you know, 10 bucks an hour, 20 bucks an hour, more money than they make now, as much as the value of money is literally just a collective delusion, um, people will do anything for money, it seems. I mean, that is what jobs are. That is what, that's how our entire economy ticks. (laughs) And the whole beauty of blockchain technology and why it's like coded this way is that, you know, it gives you a completely blank sheet of paper, a blank slate in which to completely redesign global society. But my fear is if we don't get mass adoption, everything will maintain the status quo. Ten years from now, everything will be the same. So we need the right words, the right metaphors, the right incentive mechanisms. So please let me know at Future.